This week on Tales of Araxis, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to introduce ourselves. Who the hell are we? Why are we doing a Planet Side 2 podcast? You're going to find out. Stay tuned. It's coming right up. As we go to black. That's awesome. Brand new first thing anybody sees is we screw up the intro. Fantastic. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Tales of Araxis. I will be your host, Bridger. We're glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two, won't you? Yes, Planet Side 2 is the game that I have been playing recently along with Guild Wars 2, and so we're going to be running sort of off weeks. Guild Wars 2 is every two weeks, and then Planet Side 2 is every, wait a minute, every other week. So you're going to this week... Planet Side 2, next week Guild Wars 2, then back to Planet Side, then back to Guild Wars. It's going to be a good time. I'm going to try to balance it all. We'll see if that winds up working or not. All right, so let us first introduce everybody. Like I said, I am Bridger. I'm in the Team Legacy outfit for Planet Side. You may know, also know me from the Tales of Tyria, uh, a Guild Wars 2 podcast, and or my old Company of Heroes podcast, Tales of Heroes. But joining me, I have two brand new hosts who have never been with me before. So, Army Knife, welcome, sir, representing the Vanu. Good evening. And we also have East Clintwood, re representing the Terran Republic. Welcome, sir. I can't hear you. Why can't I hear you? It would help be, uh, if I was not muted, but uh -huh. hi, everybody. You pulled what we call in the business a bridger. Uh -huh. Yes. That is, that is, I coined that phrase, much to my chagrin, a while ago. I'm, I'm learning from the master. Exactly. Exactly. That's how you get started in this. All right. Pretty, so... pretty soon all first dates will start with a fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will. As you can see, we're standing here at the Crown, uh, owned by your precious Terran Republic, which, as Army Knife was telling us, what is the inverse property of the Crown, Matt? The inverse strategic Wh property? Which, whichever cr faction holds the Crown holds nowhere else on Indar. <laughs> so that is sometimes the case. All right, so let us jump into it by saying, so what have you guys done? That's what we're going to do at the beginning of every show. We're going to say, so what have you guys done in, Guild in, in Planet Side 2 this week? What, 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 what was good? Matt, what did you do? Anything, anything good happen? Uh, as of this week, not a whole lot. There's been a lot of fending off the TR on Waterson. Um, mostly trying to hold our territory. I don't know how many people are following the specific servers. Uh, Waterson, uh, the Vanu were one of the first factions to get multiple uh, continents. We lost it to the TR the next day. They just came on at like four in the morning and <laughs> didn't leave. Uh, and, and we lost. But they actually managed to conquer all three continents uh, not too long ago. I think they were, there's, they were definitely the server first. But uh, we've basically been strategically hitting targets and trying to maintain our hold. All right. So uh, any any interesting things happen in your side of the game there, Clint? Well, map-wise, on my server, Connery, we mostly just kind of play uh, what I like to call ping pong. What will happen is uh, on... Indar will be, since we're up north, we'll push down and say we'll push really hard into NC territory. And next thing you know, the Vanu are on our warp gate. So we all fall back to the warp gate and counter <laughs> that. And then NC's there. So that's kind of just our run-of-the-mill uh, right. shenanigans there. So. so I had a very interesting situation pop up in, in my games recently. We, we had a big defense of the Manny Biolab, which is the Biolab on the north of Esamir. Uh, we did that last night. TL, Team Legacy, got on. We all uh, were slowly pushing out. We started that map with basically nothing when we came into it. We were low on population. We were low on everything. But our NC faction on Waterson was taking all of Amerish. We were apparently dedicated to it because we had 55% of the population there. So we were just wiping out everything. And, and as soon as we locked that continent, it looked as though everybody on that continent said, well, nothing to do now. Guess we'll invade the other two continents. So we saw that was happening. We're like, we don't need to go here. Let's go to Esamir. We started fighting on Esamir. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, waves and waves of planes and tanks out of the warp gate. It was crazy cool looking. And I kind of wish that happened more the time but we wound up going to the defense of Manny Biolab which was a long and grueling fight because it was really just our platoon defending it on the inside from one platoon attacking from the outside along with air and vehicle support so we couldn't ever push out to take the sat stations that's what we call them the satellite stations outside of the the the, the big fort uh, fortifications and and they couldn't ever push inside it was a big deadlock 
despite the fact that we took uh, the, 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 the our, our nemesis was the northern sat station, which is actually a tower. And they had a Sunderer parked in a devious little spot and underneath in the bottom section of the tower that we just couldn't get anywhere near. Because the jump pad that goes from the biolab down to the tower, they eventually learned that we were using that to try to attack. And they had the cannon from the tower pointed at the exit to the jump pad. Not very... Not very good for our <clears throat> uh, constitutions. But we did manage to get there a couple of times as light assault. We would kind of fade in and fall right onto the tower itself and take it. But we could never kill the Sunderer. Oh, it was, it was annoying. So that was, our, that was our fun time this past week. I don't know. That's about it. Um, so what, uh, what, are you guys ready to move on? Nothing, no, nothing else good happened, really? Well, actually, well, no, um, I, I was going to say, I think we might need to have something. Go ahead, yeah. go. Oh, I was going to say... Um... Well, you know, not as of last week, but as a caveat, anytime your faction holds Scarred Maze of Skydock, I highly suggest you taunt the other factions into attacking it, because it is the single most fun location in the entire game to defend. Uh, it is accessible only from air or pod drops, which means that you will get hit uh, orbital drop style <laughs> by hundreds of infantry if you really play it right uh, and get the other other people really pissed off um but i know we had a very good taking back of the aladdin biolab the other night um which biolabs tend to be a grind but i think because the tr on waterson love to hold aladdin we're getting fairly good at it and i can personally <laughs> say that the best thing to do is to have an outfit and be a commander in an outfit so you can order you know have people be engineers for you and then grab a max uh, I think I've managed to rack up some 26 kills with one death in a max, Dang. just 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 doing close quarters max work. Um, so if you play a max smart in a bio lab, it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely, and especially the NC maxes with their nice shotgun. <laughs> yeah, close oh yeah, range those scat maxes. Love those. So, uh, all right, uh, let's see. What else, uh, East, did you have something else that happened? Uh... Actually, yeah, uh, my outfit, we started doing, uh, recently, we would open up and run public platoons, just open to anybody, and I was actually genuinely surprised at the success of that, because it starts off, there's three or four of us, we're just kind of minding our business, doing things, and the squad's full, and I don't realize it's, it's open to a platoon, uh, outfit mate of mine was actually running it and I see people talking in platoon chat and I say when did we get extra squads <laughs> and next thing you know we're we're taking facilities all by ourselves and I'm dropping squads in different places so I, I had a really big blast it was really nice to be able to coordinate and it, it's it's a lot better than trying to herd cats as part of the normal zerg of yeah. whichever side your faction just seems to be plowing through so it was actually a really nice refreshment we did got a lot done so absolutely all right, so let's move on then. Uh, the format for this show is going to be very similar to my other show, I think. We're going to start off with a sort of after-action report. We're going to, if, we, if, if, if any of us have some interesting stories, or if we get any interesting stories from you, the viewers slash listeners, then what we'll do is we'll sort of read them off and discuss them and, and, and talk about anything interesting. Like, oh, I just unlocked breaker rockets and they suck, you know. We'll kind of do that. We've also got a feedback uh, email that's being constructed by very small robots. Uh, it's going to take a while. So <clears throat> we'll get the website and the feedback email and all that stuff working for you for, for, for hopefully for episode one, which will be in two weeks. Uh, this is episode zero, so it doesn't count. Don't forget that. All right, news. This week, Sony revealed a three-year plan, which apparently is slightly less bad than a five-year plan because we all know how well those worked out for the Soviets. Uh, that, is, that is what I'm going to take away from the naming convention here. Uh, so this is on VG247.com, and it says, uh, details its three-year plan and wants to run until 2025. I have done the math, and 2025 is not, in fact, three years away from now. So I'm not entirely sure where that headline came from, but uh, that's interesting. Uh, this is studio president John Smedley outlined his grand plan for the future of MMOs, including new continents and much, much more. So he kind of throws out a bunch of different crazy ideas, like player-owned bases, harvestable resources, which you have to escort. Isn't escorting, isn't that going to be a fun thing, guys? Can't you not even hold your breath until escort quests become a part of Planet Side 2? Yeah. That that was in Planet Side 1 to a certain degree. Um, and it actually, I think with these mechanics, has the potential to work because the way it worked in Planet Side 1, 
was uh, you had to actually, bases, in order to power their defenses and other things, I believe, you had to actually ha give them reserves of nanites, which meant that you had to go to basically nanite pumping stations with an AMS. Um, it, those of you who have seen that around, that uh, initialism around in uh, Planet Side 2, you see it as SAMS, it's because it's a Sunder or Advanced Mobile Station. Um, and I believe it was AMS's you used. It could be a different vehicle. And you pumped the nanites into that truck, and then you drove it back to the amp station. And that was actually, no, that was how you scored points for those bases. Um, so a ants. mechanic like ants. that. Ants, he says ants, not ants. Ants, A-N-T, yes. Um, ants, so the advanced nanite transports, I think. Um, so, so that's, I think, how the escort mechanic would work. Not like a uh, an idiot... Uh, AI who occasionally runs into things, but instead an idiot player who runs over hordes of friendly troops. <laughs> I would prefer that. Because <laughs> then you can, you, can, you can curse at somebody. You can't curse at an AI and make it feel bad. <laughs> now that's cool. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. That's where all the programming power in this, in this gaming community should be. How can we make computers that can feel bad? Because that'll make players feel better. Because that's what makes... Everything go round. Right. Right. Yeah, that will sell millions. Exactly. So actually, you know, though, NPC enemies they put in here, and NPC armies. He says, I don't want to call this PVE. That's not exactly what we have in mind. More like a global invasion that goes after everybody. So he's like, so what if, guys, guys, what if Araxis gets attacked by aliens in the middle of a big fight? Isn't that sound awesome? And it might actually be awesome. I don't know. <laughs> next next thing you know, they're going to be raining meteors down on players and splitting up the world. Yeah. That that was a dig at Planet Side 1 for those people who haven't played it. Isn't that the thing that opened up the tunnels underneath and the didn't yeah, work out so well? Yeah, the worst expansion pack ever. The worst expansion pack ever, TM. Uh, now, then he goes to talk about NPC Army's MOBA style going from one base to another. I don't know about that. Um, maybe. Here, here's Here's something that I think could work based on something else that I think could work. So here's here's a game called Fighter Ace 3. I don't know if anybody remembers a game called Fighter Ace 3. It was a World War II flight combat flight sim uh, MMO for all intents and purposes. You'd have hundreds of people in the sky, basically. And the way that this worked is you would have everybody in planes because the ground forces would all be AI. And they didn't need to have to be really good at, you know, AI. It wouldn't have to be a really constructed thing. The way it worked, each side, and you had the Germans, the Japanese, the French, they had historical maps, they had non-historical maps, whatever, had its own territory. And within that territory was a bunch of capturable bases, towns, production facilities. It could produce fuel, it could produce planes, it could produce munitions. And there was supply chains and things like that. So if the airport that you wanted to spawn at didn't have enough fuel, you would only get half fuel when you took off from it. You'd have to go find an airport that did. So it had a whole supply metagame built on top of it, but the way that you took territory was you get a level bomber, usually, because that does the most damage, like a B-17 or something like that, or a, a, a Lancaster. Then you fly over lo location, and when it gets to a certain damage level, that triggers an attack by NPC tanks that leave from the closest area that has a surplus of tanks, which were built in tank factories that, again, adds to the supply metagame. So you, as the bomber, are now going to have to be escorted by other players against enemy interceptors that are going to stop you. Once the actual fight is triggered, once you do enough damage to the facility, now tanks are rolling out from your side. Tanks roll out from the defender's side as well. So now you've got a new game. The new game is protect your tanks and have dive bombers, uh, you know, close action ground support go in and bomb the enemy's tanks because level bombers don't hit tanks very easily. They hit wide areas. So now you've got a brand new game. Now it's intercept the enemy's ground support and ground support your own tanks and that was a really cool concept that allowed the players to take all the fun positions and the AI to take all the garbage positions so how that ha how that could possibly be integrated into planet side 2 I kind of imagine this same kind of concept where you have convoys and supplies and things like that that are NPC controlled that need to be defended by players I don't know I think that sounds like it could or be you something could just cool. have N NPCs populate the crown <laughs> So it'd be realistic, is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> I don't know, it could work. I, I, th I think a system like that could work. I just wouldn't trust Sony Online Entertainment to implement it. Yeah. One of the best things about 
Planet Side 2 is the fact that they have basically said, here is a playground with high explosives and lasers. Have fun. Um, and, and that there is no NPC interaction at all. I think it's actually a strength of Planet Side 2 in, in its current implementation. I think as soon as we start seeing uh, invasions from other from NPCs, it's going it, it, to... I don't trust SOE to develop that in a way that works very well. I can see conceptually how it'd be cool. It's like, hey, the wormholes reopened. The actual Terran Empire are trying to reinvade and kill everybody. Conceptually cool. Worried about the execution. All right, and... The next one on the list, eSports support. East, how? How? What? Well, <laughs> I, I honestly, I can't see how they're going to have any kind of an eSport uh, because there's no, there's no arena place. There's no place where you can be segmented off from the rest of the world. So it's okay, well, here goes Team A, here goes Team B. They're really fighting for that point. And, and here comes third party, and they just leveled the place with Liberators. Well, guys, sorry, but that's the match. I, I just don't see it working. All those points aside, esports require a victory condition, which nobody has yet. Where? What? Do, why am I fighting? I don't want a sandbox. I want a game. Games have win conditions. Okay. Pull there, it back. No, there is there is a win condition. I think to, on Indar. Don't <laughs> hold the crown. Don't hold the crown. <laughs> the trick is, can you hold the crown and still hold everything else? It's the ultimate challenge. It's the ultimate challenge. That is challenge. the ultimate challenge. All right. Well, then I guess we'll have to abide by that. So, very interesting concepts. Whether they said Mac version. I like how Mac version is part of their three-year plan. Like, they've got all these pie-in-the-sky ideas, and then Mac version. <laughs> it's also on that list. <laughs> very interesting. All right, so uh, some very interesting things in there. Um, nothing really concrete. Uh, something that is concrete, though, uh, is that they have said the station cash purchases at the very least, though I would hope that uh, cert purchases also, would this would be the case. They have said that station cash purpose purchases will be made available account-wide. So if you unlock uh, a weapon that's available to all three factions on one character, it'll be available on all of your other characters. If you unlock a TR rifle, it'll be available on all other TR characters that you make, which is something I think is necessary because if you're playing on one server with a bunch of friends and say the friends stop playing, but you have some other friends that are playing on a different server, but you just played for six months on this character. Now you have to start back at square one because you went over there. And, and I mean, at least if... But with the certs, okay, it's a free-to-play game, whatever. But if you spent cash money, now you have to go back to negative cash money going over there. That's, that's a problem. Or you just find new friends. <laughs> you know, that's probably a better choice than trying to restart from square one, honestly. It's clearly the cheaper choice. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that gets implemented eventually. And they said it will be retroactive, obviously. But right now, the, um, the Reddit apparently is getting hit very hard. So I cannot link you directly to the post where they said this, but... Uh, that is something that Smedley posted personally and said, this is what, uh, what happens. I really honestly think they need to make anything you unlock account-wide. If you unlock a scope with this weapon, it should be available on that weapon with every other character that you make. Um, well, at, I, at I, this I, point, I see no reason for, for multiple characters on the same server, unless you're doing different factions. Right. In, in PS1, it kind of made sense because it was more strictly role-playing game. In this, it makes less sense because you gain starts at the same rate no matter what level you are there's no there's no curve as you gain battle rank um there should there's, be there's, though you know they never mind certs are, go certs are slow enough they're don't, slow don't start enough on exactly that. exactly <laughs> all right as long as we can all agree on that let's move on <laughs> what else do we have here this is a very interesting video. Uh, I highly recommend anybody who wants to learn how to fly really well, go ahead and, and watch this video. Uh, what he does is he shows you how to land a strike fighter really fast. And the main advantage that he points out here is the, uh, the fact that as you sort of, you sort of bank into the landing like a, like a skier would and use your vertical thrust to help slow you additionally. Now, I think he's using uh, a, a sort of the, the hover vertical thrust spec because I don't get that much vertical thrust <laughs> when I try to land like this, but maybe it's just me. He also points out a couple of different pitfalls that you can have, so I've got a link to that in the show notes, which 
are going to be on talesofteria.com for now. Uh, there, there will be their own thing eventually, but the rest of the video is pretty good. It's only about a couple seconds long, but what he points out is you can land an escort strike fighter in, from 350 kilometers per hour to zero and on the ground with zero damage in less than three seconds. And so if you master this technique and you're on fire and you need to land, that is really useful, it turns out. There is another uh, technique. For, I think that right now, actually, the vertical thrust frames are the best because there's another technique um, that allows you to fly your fighters backwards. And there is a similar uh, tutorial available backwards? online. As yes. in uh, reverse? I have to try that. Yes. Uh, I've actually, basically, you tell me more. <laughs> you take your, your fighter... And you can do this from either landing or, or flying. You need to slow down so that you're, you're stopped. You turn, and then you uh, turn opposite your roll. So you're pitching opposite your roll, and you uh, Okay, so hang on, hang on. Bar. For the people that are listening, what you're doing is you're rolling to one side. To, so yes. you're basically up, your wings are pointing vertically up and down. And then you're nosing down on the joystick and or mouse so that your nose goes falls away uh, to one side. You're also pressing uh, your A key or, or just left turning with your joystick so that you're turning up towards the sky while pressing space bar. This is easier to do on the Mosquito and the Reaver because if you go into third person view you'll have a visual cue for when you need to hit your afterburner. And that is when the uh, th uh, vents on the plane down. Once the vents have popped out and turned all the way down on the side, you just need to learn the timing. You press and hold shift, it will fl and you continue to turn. It'll flip your fighter. You can roll it right up, and you'll be flying backwards. Wow, you blew my that mind. That is quite a maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's useful well, because that, that, allows you, that allows you to attack uh, ground targets without stopping. So you continue movement. It's wonderful in dogfights because suddenly you're running away from them while also aiming and shooting at them. Okay, hang on. Uh, I think I got a video of what you're talking about. Let's see. Okay, yes. turn to the right. Thrust, and you should pitch down. Hang on. He might have messed it up there. I think he's going to try it again. Eh, eh, and didn't do it. Hang on. Let's see if he actually does it or not. But, oh, there he does. He did pitch down, and Bam. He's flying backwards. Now, does that only work so long as you have afterburner? Or can he just yes. keep going like this indefinitely? Uh, as long as you have afterburner. Oh, okay. But that is. But when, when you're taking off, when, you, when you're, let's say, repairing, mm -hmm. and, and you need to get off the ground, cause you can, uh, because when you're just taking off, your thrusters are technically facing in the right direction, um, you can do this almost instantly from a takeoff. Um, you can go from standing still to full speed backwards facing whoever was flying down shooting at you uh, in, a, in an instant. <laughs> that would or, really confuse the people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I pulled this in, in a dogfight a couple of times and killed the person because he was just so confused as to what had just happened. Where I'm flying along, I stop. He thinks I'm an easy target. Suddenly, I'm flying backwards matching his speed <laughs> to shoot at him. <laughs> wow. That is, that is crazy. Uh... The NC one is the... Okay, so uh, Tick Gillis says that uh, he's tried those aggressive landings with all three fighters. You can do it with all three, but the NC one is the easiest by a long shot. Um, and it might be true. I know that the other thing I learned from that video, the first one that we were talking about, landing gear can actually take quite a pounding as long as you're landing on a flat surface and you don't wind up skipping across it too much. So if you're doing a hard vertical landing, you'll probably be okay because the landing gear can absorb a lot of that vertical shock. Uh, I found that one out. That's kind of interesting. Falls quicker when you are sideways, so that's why it's easier to slam into the ground. Oh, so it's not that the NC is superior, it's that it's inferior. It's just because it's a flying brick. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's what it is. Okay. Which, which is why the uh, uh, flying backwards thing is so nice, because there's so much momentum on a reaver that it, it allows you to fly backwards even further. Wow. I will say I that I've noticed that. the side is fantastic in low-speed dogfights, just because unlike the other fighters, it it feels completely different, and it really does feel like a... Uh, I personally think that if you're running with a uh, flare system on a scythe, you're flying it wrong. It's, as opposed it, that, to... As opposed to just learning how to dodge the missiles. The scythe can turn <laughs> so quickly and maneuver its back end away. Because here, here's another tip for players who are using, using anti-air missiles and getting shot at by them. The anti-air missiles operate a lot like sidewinders. They have to hit... They, they track the engine heat so they go for the back of the aircraft, 
and they tend to completely avoid the front. If you fire at an aircraft that's flying straight at you with an anti-air missile, the air missile will try to go underneath it or around it in some way to fly and hit the, the, the back of it. So you want to wait to fire your air missiles until they're about not, you know facing 90 degrees perpendicular to you or a little bit after to give your missile time to turn and track. That also is a, you can be used to your advantage if you're dodging missiles because you can just try and point your tail away from the uh, way the missile is coming at you and make it miss. Of course, you have to know which direction the missile is coming from. Which is why sides are nice because yeah. they can be juked all o- jinked all over the place and, and, and turned in all sorts of weird ways. Absolutely. All right, so <clears throat> I think that's about it for, for that video. We got plenty of more tips and things like that coming up on future shows. We can't give them all away now, guys. If we gave them all away now, we'd have nothing to talk about. Maybe, kind of. Well, no, we talk about a lot of things. I was going to so, say, we can still talk. It just wouldn't be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I found out I could... I, I, I found out there's a rock on the crown you can stand on, and I can see my house. And cool. my house is called all of Indar because we own it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. All right, so <clears throat> there's another thing that I do on my other shows. Sometimes I get a little bit angry, you know, and when I get angry, I got to vent. And when I vent, it's called a bridger rant. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I have to jump in here because there's something that's out of control and it's blowing my mind right now because what we found out just recently this is a public service announcement so you guys know a lot of people say hey i gotta get this subscription because it takes way too long to get search so he gets a subscription and hey by the way you get 500 station cash it says so right there it comes with the subscription wrong apparently that's not true you only get the 500 station cash as a bonus for staying auto-renewed on your subscription. If you buy a year's worth of Planet Side 2 and spend 120 some odd dollars, but then you uncheck the auto-renew button, no 500 station cash for you. Wow, what a slimy move. Oh man, that hurts my brain. So, okay, fine. It's an agreement. Sony can do whatever they want. They do this in other of their MMOs. And apparently the problem has come up because it's not advertised anywhere. And an 11 page long thread on the stupid forums with people arguing backwards and forwards and left and right about what's okay and what's not okay about this. And, and, and they're right, okay? I, I'll admit it. Sony is able to do whatever they want. It's, it's an agreement between me and the customer. As long as they put it up front and say, 500 station cash is only available if you stay auto-renewed. That's all well and good. But that doesn't change the fact that you can make an auto-renew system that doesn't trick the customer into spending money they don't want to, okay? The auto-renew on almost every business practice ever, including your cable company or uh, your, your, your car or anything else that you sign up for a year's worth of service and it auto-renews, that is there to trick you into spending money you don't want to. Because all they would have to do is save your billing information, pop it up, and the year comes by and say, do you want another year? And you say, yes, I do. Send me an email. Say, do you want another year? Yes, I do. I do if you want convenience, make it simple for me to re-up at the end of the year. Don't make me make that decision now. A year is a long time, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot simply know that from a year from now, I am still going to be able to play Planet Side 2, willing to play Planet Side 2. Maybe I have a kid and I don't have the time. Uh, maybe I got in a car accident and I don't have any arms anymore. I don't know. Maybe that then I'll... Oh, well, I stopped playing all games. I forgot I had the subscription. Now I wind up paying Sony $120 that I can't afford because I got medical bills because my arms fell off in a car accident. Is that what you want, Sony? That's just mean. Poor cripple guy there. Making him pay money. All right. <clears throat> I'm done. I'm okay. I feel better now. And for those listening at home, if you know him in real life, and you play games with him in real life, such as board games, you listen to these at least twice a week. (laughs) Mayhap. So I try to keep those under control, though. Because we all do love Planet Side 2, or at least parts of it, (laughs) for one reason or another. That's why we're here. We're not here to rag on it, but criticism 
is usually reserved for something that you enjoy or something that you like. You usually, if something that you don't like, you don't take the time to criticize it, right? If you, if, because I don't go around to people and explain the nuances of why Call of Duty, to, you know, sucks. I just, I just don't even talk about it because I don't like Call of Duty, what it's become. So I don't talk about it. So I don't, I don't go on rants about it because it's not worth criticizing. That's how much I hate it. But when you got Planet Side 2 and I play it and I enjoy the hell out of it, but it could be better. That's, that's love right there. That's criticizing is love. All right. That's what we're here for. He's ranting because he cares. Exactly. See, East gets it. All right. So... <laughs> Let's go on to our roundtable this week. And it's entitled, <clears throat> Just Who the Hell Are These Guys? Uh, and that's, that's what we're talking about. This is episode number zero. So you're like, why should I talk? And who are these guys? Why are they talking to me about Planet Side 2? So let's talk about gaming background. Uh, Matt, what is your gaming background? What games do you enjoy? What games were you big into for the most periods of time? Well, uh, to begin with, so that people get the best idea of who I am, I want to say that uh, I, I, I propose that we call it the hexagonal table, just because this is the future. Um, oh, and instead of the round table, because yes, everybody knows yes, that. Yes, every, well, everything, it's, everything it might everything as well be a triangle, triangle table, though. I'm pretty sure that's, it'll be a triangle table. But, but, but you know, they used hexagonal paper in, planet, in a Battlestar Galactica. Oh. And, and the hexagons are all over everything that's sci-fi these days. Mm. So it's the hex table. Fair enough. Which, table. which makes it sound like we're hackers. But um... <laughs> <laughs> The hacks table. We're using the hacks table. All right. <laughs> anyway, my, my gaming background. Uh, basically, since I could sit down and play a computer, I've been playing it. Um, and for me, it's been predominantly shooters, although I will play pretty much anything, especially if it's good. Um, I avoid sports games, but... There's a genre out there. I've played it, and I do not like visual novels, so let's not get into that little very specific foray of gaming history. All right. Uh, so for myself, I come from a mostly FPS background, uh, which is Quake uh, 1 and Team Fortress specifically was where I sort of cut my teeth on the online gaming world. And then I went on to uh, Day of Defeat and lots of different Half-Life mods. Natural Selection, tons of great things in there. Uh, Counter-Strike, of course. But at the same time, I was playing Red Alert and Red Alert 2 and Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3. So I was, I was also in the RTS space. So I've always been looking for a fusion of the strategy and first-person shooter thing, which is why I played Planet Side 1 for a good, uh, good while. Uh, so that's sort of my background. Mostly FPS, also RTS, and every once in a while, I descend into the black abyss known as Civilization, and I don't come up for air for another two months. Uh, but there you go. That's about it. So, East, what about you? Well, uh, similar to you, gentlemen, I originally started off playing uh, first-person shooters at a very young age. I mean, I remember the original Quake and playing that and all of its single-player glory on an ancient computer. And from there, I, I've, I've moved on. I've played just about every genre of, of game imaginable. Uh, I including just about every major shooter. And I, I play a lot of MMOs, so I got the opportunity here with the original Planet Side, and then again with Planet Side 2, where I get to have an MMO and a shooter at the same time, and that just fills me with joy. All right, so let's talk about wh where, wh our relationship with Planet Side 2. Because that's, like you said, it's, it's about caring, really. I don't know why I just turned into an old lady with cancer, but I did. <laughs> East, can you tell what... us? Can you tell us what you like about the game, honey? Well, I was a long-time Eve addict, and Ooh. it lets me have that grand strategy and an important feel, and uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of players all doing something. And because I mean, I played that game for the better part of a decade, so I get that fix. I, you know. And I don't have to commit the same amount of time necessary to, to get that enjoyment. So I really like that. Not so to mention that's that's why it's important. Not to mention there's Twitch gameplay and actual physical exactly. skill involved. Uh so um what what are some of your favorite things there, Army Knife? What 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 parts of Planet Side Two are uh, make you go, yes? Well, I have to say that that for Planet Side Two it is Definitely, uh, in no small part, the size um, and the scope of the engagements. I mean, when I think my, my, even on my first night way back in beta, uh, three, three or four months ago back into beta, um, when you are hitting like 
the ground in this night, beautiful nighttime environment, and there are lights all over the place from uh, uh, bullet tracers and rockets flying off, and then an aircraft swoops in. You've got tanks moving in, and you've got infantry just dying by the does. It, it's just the most immersive and amazing uh, shooter experience I've yet had, simply because this is really a combined ops game. And nobody is an NPC. These are all people who are all playing together, all operating together, or zerging together. Um, and and not only is it is is it so fantastic in, in concept and execution, but visually this is an incredibly stunning game. And just even sitting and listening, and and watching, is a great experience. When you see a massive battle take place, when you see twenty TR tanks, when you see twenty prowlers moving up on you, and you know you're boned. You really know your bone. <laughs> um, and I also love the achievement factor of this game. I mean, it, despite the fact that there is this no victory condition, endless war thing going on, you will still feel like a badass if you say, uh, take a five man squad and capture an entire uh, amp station simply because you know how to. I mean, if, well, because you've gone behind enemy lines and you know that your Zerg is going to come up quickly enough that you can cap every, destroy all the generators, cap all the satellite, get everything prepared, and just sit on the points. <laughs> um, and my outfit has done that a couple of times. So we've managed to take entire amp stations before the TR even knew that they had lost them. Um, and, and achievements like that, that really, where you're going, you are the underdogs going up against the, the massive enemies and you come out on top is i think just uh, an amazing experience i definitely feel that especially even situations where you know you can't win but it's like the alamo we're like we're holding this bio lab as long as we possibly can they're gonna have to pry it from our cold dead finger your platoon is still in this bio lab holding up like two or three of the enemy platoons despite the fact that the battle lines have gone way past it already and and you're just still holding on to it and tying up a huge chunk of their resources that's a really cool feeling to slowly finally lose this and you're like well guys we held it for an hour and a half good job you know that's that's a really cool feeling and i have to agree with you the immersion factor my immersion is so i, I it must just be the scale because it doesn't feel like there's things in this game that haven't been done in other games before, right? Like the the gunplay, the the sounds, the the movements, the maneuvers you can fly in other games. I mean, Battlefield 3 is kind of what it feels like. Battlefield 1942 is is very much what it feels like too. But there's something here that provides that extra step and I think it is the size. Because it's more than 64 players. It's more than this limited set where, okay, 64 players, but half of them are dead at any given period. So you only ever see about 30. No, you yeah, see hundreds. And, and I want to, to, to tag on to that, that you don't necessarily see hundreds. That's what's so brilliant about oh, yeah. this game, is you may only see about 80 people per side. But because of the respawn system and how quick it happens and, and the fact that you can have multiple attacks coming from different angles with different aircraft, it fe certainly feels like hundreds of people, even when on an entire server the max that you can have is, is I think, 800 per faction. So it will feel a lot, you'll, we'll feel that there are a lot more people involved in a battle than there actually are, and that is an amazing little, little magic trick they've managed to pull off. It just it gives you such a sense of accomplishment if you do anything at all, like even minor, yes. like yeah, I took this with me and my two bestest friends, yes, and we killed like five guys, and then we went out away, and they took it back, and we took it back from them. I just I feel like a great person, even though I did something that menial, yeah, or, or just being a dick so. to another fact. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that, of course, you know the smug factor. You can't. Yeah. Oh, we we parked, a, we parked we parked a Sunday way on top of this hill and just spawned snipers and and, and lobbed grenades <laughs> down at them. <laughs> uh, Guilla in the chat points out when we were talking about the Alamo feeling. He says, "Ah, I usually press the record button and document how boned we were." <laughs> oh yeah, Guilla's in my uh, my uh, outfit, so uh -huh. uh, so usually we're on that the uh, boning end of the TR tank zergs, and and certainly we've had a couple of Havars where. Uh, we lost because of the. I, I don't know how much you have played with it, Bridger, and I think this is something we're going to get to, right? The, uh, at least one of my problems with the game, which is the uh, fact that, the unless they start rotating warp gates, you're really only going to get to see about a third of the map. 
yeah. unless your faction happens to capture everything. So, but the new, so you may not have seen the new uh, uh, Quartz Ridge. But the new I Quartz Ridge. I haven't, and I really wanted to, but I stopped playing TR right after that, and I started playing NC. NC never goes near the Quartz Ridge. It's only TR and Vanu that fight over that. And it's a fantastic place to fight, especially because it it actually has a pass that is a choke hold, or, or it is a choke point uh, to advance onto Havar Tech Station. Uh, but lately, the TR on Waterson have been zerging with tanks hard enough that the, that doesn't matter that it's a choke point. They just come <laughs> with everything. So. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's definitely one of the things. And I kind of wish they rotated it, like every two months or something. Okay, we're rot rotating warp gates, because that would just kind of refresh the game every couple of months, you know? You and only we fight had over that in beta. Kind of, sort of, because when they were trying to do balance and figure out who was where, we, we had rotation. It was really nice, because I got to see, in closed beta, every single starting location mm -hmm. on Indar, for example. We got that got to be our warp gate for a few weeks uh, section, and it really helped you. You got to learn the terrain. You got to see everywhere. It's a beautiful game, and it's unfortunate you don't get to see all of it. So, oh yeah, like on on Amherst, the VR the VS warp gate currently is stuck in the ugly ass end of of Amherst, and the NC and TR have these really like lush kind of foresty, really cool places with these geode things that are cracking out of the ground, and the Vanu section is just mountainous brown huh. terrain. It's got it's got a couple of cool bases, like there's one base that has an awesome air air station, but other than that, it's not nearly as pretty as the rest of the map, and so I. I do hope that they're going to warp, rotate warp gates because um, I really even just want to look at the other parts of the map. Yeah, Esamir, I've only ever seen that the one place, and Amerish too, I've only ever seen from the NC perspective. So that's that's very interesting. And I, I do hope they rotate them every couple of months. I think that would definitely refresh. I mean, it's not a CS server, essentially. I mean, if you could play Dust 24 7, uh, but eventually you kind of. Maybe uses with dust too, <laughs> you know. At least for that. <laughs> <laughs> and and we do have a lot of different places to fight over. I mean, you've got uh, large chunks of places, for example, that you're fighting on the three different continents. Even if you're only stuck to one warp gate, but I still think it would be nice to to refresh them. So, uh, East, what's one of the things that you kind of wish was different? Um, the gun stat system. I know we've spoke about this in the past, and I know it's all over the internet too, but it really does, to, to quote Peter Griffin, grind my gears. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, the, the dots or bars when it's showing the, the gun stats, it's, it, they're arbitrary numbers. They don't really represent anything. I'm a fan of the theory that they just kind of had a dartboard with numbers on it and <laughs> put on a blindfold, and whatever they ended up with was what they said there was. And then the guns themselves, there really isn't that much uh, in the way of variation, so I'd like to see both you know, uh, aesthetically appearance-wise and functionality, because uh, the guns are all kind of the same. It's like, well, this one gets more upgrades than that one. Yeah. So... That's that's my weird. biggest, my biggest I think issue off you know, the top of my head. You know head. what though? I have found some guns suck, and others don't, and that's that pretty much the enough. variability. Uh, I, I'm definitely with you there because the bar system would be adequate were it accurate, but I do not trust it because when I go and say, hmm, what I really want is to unlock a really nice assault rifle for my medic for long-range engagement. So I go to the one that apparently says long-range and has the highest accuracy. I'm like, that's the one I want. For when I'm supporting in specific battles when I want a long-range weapon, I get it, and it's like all over the place. And I'm, what? You made me spend station cash on this garbage. Uh, and this is when, you know, the, the trial period was broken for a while. I didn't want to test. I, like, oh, I don't want to mess with that in case I lose my cash. So, uh, but I was like, it's fairly clear. This is the most accurate one. It says so according to stats. I think, how could that be wrong? <laughs> yeah, right. But then I play the default weapon for engineers, and I can rape things in half a second because it it's gone. But then I get something else that's supposed to be best for close quarters, and it's not. Yeah. And the, the real irony is the default medic weapon for the NC is the most accurate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know what? Actually, I think I got the one unlock, the GS-22. I think that's what it's called, something like that, something 22. I think that's the one I'm using all the time. It's the one that came with the Alpha Squad unlock. Uh, it's the one I really like. Um, but anything with a 2X reflex scope, I try out because I can't... I, I, that's, the, that's my favorite scope. I don't like using any of the zoomed-in scopes because I don't feel like any of the weapons are accurate enough. And if you're twitched to semi-auto mode to get the accuracy... 
it feels like I'm never killing anything. I can plink away, and by the time I shoot my third round, the guy is behind cover, you know? Well, that's because you never have to fight your own snipers. Fight. Oh, you're saying if you, if I was on another faction fighting NC snipers, I might have to use the long range. I see. Well, not that you <laughs> might, but that they would stand still and get shot at. I see. <laughs> So, that, te- that seems to be the case with the NC ones. They they stand in one place, and I can plank them. <laughs> they also have the least shields. So, yeah, it, it's it's definitely. I feel like when they create a weapon, they should really create a role for the weapon, not just like, well, let's make it just like that other one, but with more accuracy and less recoil. Well, the nice thing is that I think they did that, or or yeah, they did do that for the heavy weapons. Hmm. The execution has been a little questionable, although um, I think the old Lasher was actually better than people gave it credit for. The new rendition of the Lasher is still pretty good, although in close quarters situations, I'd almost rather have the old version of the Lasher, um, although it was a little unbalanced. That, that's because... the, uh, the sort of heavy, heavy weaponry, right? Not the light yeah, machine, so, but like so the for, chain for gun people who equivalent. don't know... Uh, the three heavy weapons for the factions are the T-Argot, the mini chain gun, which is basically a very accurate bullet hose that <laughs> everybody hates because it's very good. Um, the jackhammer, which is, I think, still broken. It's the NC weapon. It's a giant shotgun that Super shoots very fast. Super semiotic automatic shotgun, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's not as good as apparently the regular faction shotguns. <laughs> um, wow. It's, whoops, that's what I've heard. I, I have not tested it. I'm not going to spend the thousand certs by building up a new NC character just to test that one weapon. Um, And then the Vanu get the Lasher. It was essentially a Ghostbusters gun that would kill you uh, because it had about as much range as as the jackhammer itself. Uh, But when you uh, fired it, it wouldn't do enough damage unless you aimed down the the ranges that they limited it to because the beam literally just stopped at about 15, 20 feet. Um... You would hurt yourself in most instances of using it. But if you could get the distancing right and you aimed down the site, it did a lot of damage very quickly and it had an area of effect. The new one is basically like the other Vanu weapon, the PPA. It shoots little balls that un- unfortunately, when you look at the side, look like glowing teal sperm. Um, so you shoot the sperm at the people and the sperm explode. Um, and that's the new Lasher, which is uh, uh, still hard to use. It's hard to get used to. Cause Can I just very... say you had a really interesting hand motion for the, the shooting, the sperm, at people? <laughs> I, just, I, I have to point that out in case anybody missed it. So uh, hopefully that'll be on the actual recording for anybody who the stream was still down for. Because that was uh, uh, <laughs> a wonderful <laughs> moment. Yes, All right. Splat- stream is it, back it, it, there. It, they call it splash damage for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he did not just say that. Well, it's okay. I got the audio recording of that, so that'll be interesting. So okay. uh, so let's see. What else? What else? Uh, I mean, the, the, one, the other thing that I really like about the game, and let's intertwine likes and dislikes. The other thing that I, I really like, like about the game is because there is a, there's like a lot of games in this game. I mean, there's there's the infantry combat game. There is the tank combat game. There's the air combat game, and there's the games that are the Im- the the intertwining of all of those other games. You could play even just within the infantry branch, playing a light assault on an infiltration mission by yourself with like a shotgun, trying to get behind enemy lines and and take out their sunderers with C4, or just try and go into a base and kill as many people by shooting in the back as possible. That's a completely different game than playing a frontline heavy assault, which is a completely different game from playing a support engineer, which is a completely different game from playing an infiltrator who's trying to hack stuff and get their whole squad in there by hacking an enemy vehicle terminal inside the middle of the giant base and then spawning a sunder and having his entire steam spawn on top of it. Like, that's a, that's a very different, <laughs> different, different game. And even within the air game, there's different games. You've got Liberator pilots and, 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 uh, and ESF pilots, and that's just one thing I really like about it. So, I don't know. What, what yeah, it has a lot of depth in a lot of... It's got both breadth and depth, mm-hmm. and that is wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, I really it, agree. So yeah. It's just because uh, you can say. Pay. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say this is the most fun with a shotgun and jetpack I've had since Natural Selection one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait. So you're saying you didn't have that much fun with Natural Selection two then? Yeah, with the, the the net code and some yeah, other issues, but yeah. <laughs> we're not code. going there though. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so yeah, we're getting people connected back to the stream here. Oh, there's Warwitch is watching. Hello, sir. 
decided to tune in after all. We're going to get you to play Planetside 2, maybe? Eh? Eh? I don't think so. He's stuck it's, it's in 1944 got... <laughs> playing uh, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, which we were just casting today. That was kind of an interesting experience. But yeah, check it's out got... Warwitch TV for that every, every Sunday around the middle of the day. And I think he's doing something tomorrow. He's having his wife play Return to Castle Wolfenstein single player and commenting <laughs> on, on how she plays. So that'll be interesting. All right. Well, so... let's hope the marriage survives. Yeah, right? <laughs> 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 All right, so let's let's jump back here. Let's talk back to planet side. Focus. Let's do it. Uh, what else then is something that could use some tweaking? Uh, what do you think, East? What's one of your things that you wish? What else? What else could be good? The biolab stalemate is oh, uh, not one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah, lots of choke points. So, yeah, and, not, uh, it's not just the choke points. It's the fact that it becomes a slog. I mean, it's one. It is kind of nice, like I said at the start of the show, to grab a max and have an engineer and support. But there's just something about the mechanic where I mean, it's broken servers. Uh, early near launch, we broke Waterson because of biolab stalemates. There were just so many people and so many grenades being spawned in one location. The server actually broke. Yeah, I think the major flaw with the biolab is the spawn for the defenders is like within visual range of the SCU. It's like, so you have to kill this so that we can't spawn anymore, but we spawn almost on top of it. It's really hard to kill that and the other things. It's so contained and so compact. I kind of wish they moved the spawn somewhere sort of towards the edge of the, the whole thing and make it a little bit harder for the defenders. Um, but at the same time, you get the opposite, because like, right now, basically what you have to do in order to capture it is choke the defenders inside their spawn and spawn camp them. But at the same time, in order for the defenders to win, they have to spawn camp the other guys by just blocking those teleporter rooms. And I don't know, it's just, it's an intractable problem, right? Because that's, you... that's, I think, is part of the problem, is the only way to win, it just requires spawn camping. And there should yeah. be some actual tactics here that can result in a win, so... I wonder, here's what I think. I wonder if this was the way. Like, this this would probably require too much coding, but I'm kind of figuring um, th there needs to be an unpredictable nature to how you spawn in. And if you want that small of a thing, it can't be predictable to where, okay, they're going to be spawning in these three spots, so just set up a bunch of guns and make sure they can't leave the spawn. Um, it, it feels like, to me, there needs to be a way to get people in there and flying around... Uh, light assault wise or, or just getting them to able to have some kind of some kind of boundary some kind of fighting because when you actually have the attackers break out of those spawn rooms uh, out of the teleport rooms it can become really intense where you're fighting for buildings and you're going you know house to house kind of fighting and it's, it's really cool and people trying to flank around the far exterior to where you're not expecting it and you can get a bunch of kills shooting people in the back so that can be really fun but when you're at the stalemate of the attackers can't possibly get in, or the defenders are stuck inside their spawn. It's not fun. How do you fix that? That's a really tough problem. Well, it's it's the issue. I mean, you can have an awesome time in a bio lab when it's about a full squad or two versus a full squad or two. Any more than that, and it becomes the grind. And I think it's an issue of the quarters being so close with all of the objectives in a centralized location. Hmm. Now, what would be cool and I don't think they're going to do it, but it would be cool, is if you had other structures, like, say, at one of the satellite bases, for instance, had the shield generator for the SCU. Ah. So you could teleport to that and try and defend the shield generator in another location. The SCU can stay in the center of the base, but put some other shield gens or other objectives, like shield gens, at the satellite bases or other bases that aren't satellite bases, but you can only teleport to from the main area. So that would... I think pull some of the fight out of the main bio lab until you know the SCU were going to get rushed, um, and it would allow you to uh, actually have multiple objectives instead of just like okay, as soon as the satellite bases are taken, the faction that's in the middle of the bio lab is probably not going to get them back, and that's part of the problem is because it's so hard to get to those bases without the teleporters, and it's so easy to get into the base from there from those with the sunder or outside all of them and the jump pads. 
it just focuses the fight too much on the interior of the bio lab without and concentrates all the people, which is where you get a lot of the issues. And the other issue that pops up is um, because of that concentration of players, you get draw distance issues. The game starts drawing people at like shotgun range as soon as there are too many players in in one area. Um, and that is a huge issue. I mean, on, on, I've fought in tech labs that were this crowded, where I don't know if anybody is super familiar with the layout of tech labs, but on the second floor where there's uh, uh, the, the shield generator, access to the shield gen for the SCU, there's that control point in like what looks like a, a really poorly constructed set of op- office cubicle walls <laughs> um, and some bri- bridges across yep. the sides, some catwalks across the sides. Uh, I have fought where you could not see like enemies on the other side of the catwalk, and I've just tossed grenades to kill them because that's just the easiest way rather than running over there and getting shot by three maxes and just throw a blind <laughs> grenade at people you should be able to see because it was so crowded. So yeah, push the fight out from the center of the bio lab, and I think that will solve a lot of the bio lab issues. The other thing I'm thinking is is you want to discourage people from super zergs, right? You don't want to have six platoons all fighting for the biolab, though sometimes that seems to be the only way to actually take one. But, uh, you know, the, the only way is to throw bigger and bigger numbers than your opponent. What if there was some spawn penalty? The more, the bigger the numbers of your own people in a territory, the slower the spawn time, the longer the cooldown before you could spawn in that territory. Like I, like, um, for example, let's say you've got like six platoons all trying to defend a bio lab. When you die, it, the game looks and says, you know, we've got six platoons. Uh, there's going to be an extra five second timer put onto anybody spawning in the bio lab territory. If you spawn somewhere else, you're fine. Back at the warp gate, there's no penalty. But that sort of would encourage people to maybe go somewhere else. Uh, and and make the, make the server stop smoking. Um, and at the same time, that would only affect people on a side that was overpopulated within that one zone. It wouldn't affect both sides. If one side is getting overwhelmed, then the side that is doing the overwhelming is the one that has a higher spawn penalty because they have too many people and it causes problems with the game like the clipping issues you're talking about. That seems like it might work, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I can see it working. Medics would be... Uh... Really, really high in demand. You'd Ooh, see yeah. a lot less uh, engineer and uh, heavy assault spam. You'd see a lot more medics because you can get people into the fight faster that way. So, you know, there's another about bases. There, there are some complaints about tech labs being too hard to take because of the shields. Mm-hmm. The shield shield gen being within the actual building that you're trying to protect, <laughs> or that you're trying to attack rather than in an outlying building. Because in most bases, like amp stations, all the protective shields for the central core of the base are outside of that building. But in tech Which is, labs, by the, the way, inside. the most brilliant defensive design is seen since the Maginot Line. <laughs> <laughs> in the future. Yeah, in the future. Yeah. They, there's some general genius that says, why didn't we put the shields inside the shields? Well, it turns out that would have cost an extra $2 billion. Why? Two, Just magnetic something nanites. or other physics, you know. Oh, okay. Well, we want to save money. Cut the corners for me, would you, buddy? I don't think we're going to be fighting over Araxis. <laughs> <laughs> Fight's there. But Nobody anyway, there. So, so I think that um, I think the problem isn't that tech labs are broken. I think the way that they are sieged is broken. Because they're actually, they're, there's one, there are two primary entry points to a tech lab. Uh, and that is th- from the back. There's an entryway in there and from the roof. And lately I've seen TR, a few TR, try to take tech labs from uh, roof assaults. But you can't get yeah, from the roof. The only way, you, the is only an way you can get down is the elevator that winds you up in exactly the same place you would be if you came in through the back. Yeah, but it gives you another avenue. And actually what I've seen a lot, a lot of lately are uh, uh, light assaults camping the elevator for kills. Um, which usually means that you have to grab a max and clean the shaft. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's an interesting concept but yeah, yeah I, but, I would but anyway, like to see something but, but there is actually the a third way in that most people aren't asserting I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to, I don't want to spoil it because I, I don't want to completely change the metagame overnight and, well you already <laughs> missed it, that boat I mean it was posted to reddit the other day you're oh, talking yeah, that's about right. the diffuser that's right. yeah, the, the, the diffuser, yeah the shield diffuser, shield diffuser. Which, is a, which actually is a viable assault tactic for uh, 
tech plants, but I don't see a lot of people doing it, and I actually, I actually haven't seen anybody do it. And even that is is a little risky unless you get about three or four sunders with the right equipment. Yeah, the other thing that I've always could, is is the tech plant itself is not a problem as long as they're not a sunderer inside of it. When yes. there's a sunderer inside of it and enemies spawning inside of it, that's the only time a tech plant is a stalemate. Otherwise, a tech plant is a really interesting fight between both sides trying to race to get in from their spawns outside of it. And that's a very interesting fight, I think. But uh, what you do at that point is you get two platoons of light assault with C4 and you go over the shields and blow up the sunderers and bam, now you're in business. Unless they or, just spawn or you just another one. sunderers with furies and you, you shield diffuse in and use the furies. The Furies um, are the uh, grenade launchers? No, the Furies are the anti-vehicle oh, grenade anti -vehicle launchers. Grenade. They're the, they're the, yeah, the they're rapid the, uh, shooting right. five-shot ones. Bulldogs, which is what was seen in the Reddit video, are primarily anti-infantry mm -hmm. and actually kind of poor choice against Sunderers. Right. But if you, if you can afford Furies, they are fantastic anti-vehicle weapons. Um, Sunderers actually sometimes make better tanks than tanks. Ooh. I've actually been outfought by uh, a Sunderer with dual oh, Furies before. We, so. we have done we have we like have several times. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I love attacking tanks in a, in a properly kitted out Sunder. It's just the most fun. You just Blockade make some... armor, dual furies, and it's it's a whole big mess. You just make some German yeah. kid on the other end and slam his keyboard and go, "Die, you fight, you hate the flirtings. You know. Oh, uh, I, I have a German in my outfit. Speech. I get it first person. <laughs> 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 to 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 oh, those and and a pu please a public service announcement in the the regular spawn room. For tech plants, there is a teleporter in the back. Please use it. It brings you right into the middle of the uh, tech plant. That is to which I was referring, just in case. You yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> All right. So, yes. So, yes. Teleporter uh, from a tech plant, you're saying? Yeah. In, in, in the spawn rooms of the tech plants, there's a teleporter spawn room that brings you right into the center of the tech plant. Oh, so never mind. It's not just the Sunderer thing. You don't even need it's the Sunderer. I thought that the only way to get in there was to run. That's because of what the Zerg does, and, and I mean, on our faction, we've tried oh. to do it. It's just a public service announcement. There is a teleporter. You can use it, and you can camp it. I, I have run, I have done that and run face first. Like, I've had been, that area been camped, so I'm like, oh yeah, because like a, a spawn, literally a spawn before, it hadn't been used. Then I run into it, oh yeah, I'm going to take them down this time. I'm going to get in. They don't know this, this teleporter's here. I'm going to hit a whole bunch of guys from the back. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. I step through and there's two maxes and like three engineers. <laughs> all the managers all pointed at this thing. <laughs> it's like, well, uh... <laughs> Hi, gentlemen. I'll just see myself out now. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that, that's what I was like. Okay, okay, guys. We're going to the tower. <laughs> it's like fall back at that point. We have lost the tech plant. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like one of those shield entrances should be anti-vehicle only. That might solve the whole problem. Maybe not the side ones. Maybe the side ones are anti-everything still. But maybe the back you know, shield is anti-vehicle only or something like that. Uh, I just... It feels like... But I guess you get to Sunder to get inside if you want. It just feels like there's such a, a cluster. But at the same time, some of the best XP I had when I was in the beta was defending one of those things. I managed to get, like, uh, behind the enemy lines as they saw it, and they would just run past me and die. Over, I ran out of ammo at least six lives in a row, just killing people who ran past me, and then finally running up and trying to knife people instead. <laughs> it's... Very good XP. Uh, but yeah, so tech plants, definitely unique in how difficult they are to take. I don't want to take away that defensible nature of them, because we want them to be defendable. Especially because that's kind of what makes Esamir so lovely as, as, a, play, uh, as a, an, a grand strategy map. I think of all the maps, of all the three continents, Esamir is kind of a grand strategy map. It has few bases. You can actually say, okay, this base is important. This one is important. We need to hold eyes a tech plant because it is, it is the only tech map or tech plant on the entire map. So if you do not hold eyes and have it linked to your faction, you can only get your heavy tanks from the warp gate. Yep. Yeah, I found that out the hard way one time. So... Uh, that's definitely that's definitely something that needs to be looked at. Somebody proposed switching the two, switching, put the shield generator outside, put the SCU inside. That's a very interesting decision, and I think that might be more useful because uh, you can still, if you have the SCU inside, buried at the back top of the base where it's really hard to get to unless you really wipe out everything in there, 
Um, that seems like a decent place to bury the SCU to me, since the spawning is usually more important than the shields. But uh, uh, on the tech plant, it's the other way around. Yeah, the way that, the way that tech plants are lo physically laid out. If the sh if the shield generator were on the outside, it would completely negate the defensibility of. Them. And and here's the other thing: is that tech plants with all of the guns on the top manned are really really hard to take, because though there are so many anti aircraft and anti ground guns, and they will they can actually just the base itself can can defend itself against individual squad attacks. All right, so let's we've talked about tech plants a whole lot. What else is uh, is is really uh, good? I think the the variation of the ter terrain and territories and things to fight over is really nice. That's one of the things I like a lot. I mean, tech plants, a fight at a tech plant is very different than a fight at a bio lab. It's very different than a fight at an amp station. I think amp stations are the most fun because you can have people on the walls and, and trying to push them back and things like that. Um, and I think the, the fact that an amp station on one location is a very different fight than an AM station on a, di at a different location, especially on a different continent, because of the just the layout of the surrounding territory. So attacking it from different directions really has different outcomes. It's a very cool, cool thing. And there's there's even one on Esamir that's like snowed over and, and broken uh, of one of the AMP stations. So it's oh. a very interesting fight. Um, it's a very annoying fight because it's actually very difficult, and there's a bio lab there also cover covered in snow because it makes it difficult to get up to the towers and take the uh, jump pads to get around. Uh, let's see. So what else? Uh, one of the my biggest pet peeves is how goram long it takes to get anything. I'm a generalist. This is a nightmare game for me. I want to switch to whatever is needed for our squad, but I feel punished every time I do so because... I don't have all the toys I had on my other one. I don't have the I don't have the 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 you know the attachment. I don't have the ra underslung rail. I don't have the suppressor. I don't have the op have the upgraded utility things. I don't have jump packs that can take me from here to there in 16 seconds. I don't have a repair gun that can repair a tank from zero to 100 in 1.5 seconds. I don't have a med gun that can rep that can regenerate and heal people from six feet away. I don't have any of those tools unless I spec deeply. This is a game that's really good for specialists, but for me, when I want to jump into a reaver to help out when my team needs air support, when I want to jump into a liberator to jump in when we need a gunship, when I want to run a, a sunderer for when our team needs a Sunderer. I want to be able to do all of those things well whenever we need them, but I am can't. And that's really frustrating. Even if I spent money, I spent more than $100 in this game, and I've got less things unlocked than I did in Battlefield 1942 when I bought the game and it just came out. Then I had every class and every ability that every class had, and I could fly any plane, and I could do just as well as anybody else. So that really grinds my gears. It's going to take me months Literally. to feel competent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the sad part is, is that it, I guess for some players, you know, they really like that, but the devs specifically made the game like that. I remember watching uh, dev streams at some point, and they were talking specifically about how they want the game to require people to specialize, and I, I hate that because sure. I like, I, I have video game ADD or something yeah. because I, I have to be doing something different all the time, or and I want to be able to do whatever the, you know, the right thing is for what we need. If we're getting hit by air, I want to be able to switch to an anti-air. If we you know, need to stop tanks, vice versa. You know, I need to be able to take out the tanks. I don't want to be like, well, I'm only good at using a sniper rifle. Sorry, guys. And I hate that. <sighs> and, and let me ask this question, because this is an interesting question. I mean, ha have you guys seen the most recent extra credits by any chance? No, I have not yet. No. So the most recent extra credits was talking about uh, genre mashing. You know, when you've got, uh, you know, a first-person MMO, for example, um, or any other ways to mash genres together. One of the points that they made is that often developers will tie a leveling system into a game either in a way that it shouldn't be because they just do it based on some other game, not how it will best serve the game you're putting it in, or they'll just tie a leveling system onto a game because, huh, if we put a leveling system in here, maybe they'll play longer. And then they very quickly say, that is not how you do things. What you should do is identify the core aesthetic of the game. What, what, what feeling, what play aspect, what core concept makes your game fun, and then figure out what parts of these genres can be combined in a way to support the core gameplay. Which raises the question, 
in what way does a leveling and certification system support the core gameplay of Planet Side 2? I would like to raise that question because I honestly don't have a really good answer to that. I'm going to disagree with you and I say that I'm going to say that they actually nailed it because even if it was implemented poorly, as far as concepts go, they nailed it, which is specialization in the sense of different people for different jobs and and I think Planet Side 2 is is kind of very good in in this one regard which is playing a support guy is actually fun and rewarding in this and that doesn't happen in other uh, massive shooters. I mean, if you if you were say like in Battlefield Three, would you ever be a dedicated troop transport guy? Hell no, that's boring. You would never do that. Even if it was awesome to be able to like kit out an, an amazing APC, you wouldn't do that. In Planet Side Two, very rewarding to be a dedicated Sunderer guy or a dedicated Galaxy guy. So the, there are rewards for dedicating yourself to support roles, which is something that is is awesome, and it's actually fun to play these roles. Um, and I think that every role has its has its nuance. And as long as you're not like the three of us who have role ADD, <laughs> I think it can be a very rewarding game. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, East, what, what's your thought? Well, um, it's kind of half and half. I I like the cert system ish. I don't. I'm going to say that loosely. I like it, uh, the, the concept, because that it, it is good for kind of. It goes with the engine. It goes with the point of the game. And then on the other side, we have the leveling system, which is nothing. Yet we're, we're ranking up and leveling up, and it gives Master us nothing. Master Sergeant, we get a, Shooter Sergeant, and I get decals for my eek. shoulders, <laughs> which and, don't even show up because I like. I apply, I see that I can put a decal on my reaver, and then I I enable it, and I see no change. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I guess I did that and didn't do anything. So, like, that's just kind of something they threw in there. I don't know if they did it as an afterthought or it was something they wanted to, they had all burner, but that one, that, that does not support the uh, design uh, of the game, at least in my opinion. My, my main argument here is that they did it right in some situations, but they did it very poorly in others. The way that they did it right is that I feel the first certification for anything that you can get, short of a weapon, where let's talk about only the upgrade certs, not the weapons, that's a whole other can of worms, but the first certification for anything should be really cheap and not be super effective, but you should at least get the option, right? Like They started doing that with yes. the zoom optics for uh, vehicles, weapons, for example. That right. used to be back in beta, that was 25 certs, now it's only one, so exactly. go ahead. So they, for a number of the certs, they did it correctly. And they don't even have to start at one. You could just start at 10. If 10 unlocked the first option for every single certification upgrade, I would be happy as a clam because the first time you unlock something is usually the most important. The first time you can even get access to flares, that first jump from not having flares at all to having flares on a 45 second cooldown, that is a massive jump in your available power, right? It's so this a is, night and day difference. It's a night and day difference. If that first jump was 10 certs and then the next jump was 100, I don't care. But the fact that the first jump is 200 certs or is it 100? It's 100 or 200. That's a huge goddamn investment. You know, that, that just grinds my gears right there. So that I, 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 I like the way that they did a lot of the certs. I just wish they did all of them that way. And C4, 200 and 500? What? And I don't even want to know ridiculous. who thought that one up. That's, that's, that's actually another thing that goes on my list. It appears, based on some of the certification costs, like the C4, that what they're trying to do is balance through scarcity, which will never work in a year from now. Because we all know that eventually everybody's going to unlock all the stuff that they want in the specific classes that they play the most. Like, even I am going to have, in a year from now, all the stuff that I want unlocked for Medic, Engineer, and Heavy Assault. Those are the three that I'm going to play the most of. And then, like, Reaver. And I'm not going to feel that I need to unlock anything else, but I'm going to have C4 on all those guys if I have any extra certs. You know, because that's pretty powerful. And so what you're doing is if you're trying to say, well, this is okay that it's this powerful because not a lot of people will have it because we made the cert cost real high, wink, wink. Well, that doesn't matter. A year from now, everybody's going to have it anyway because they're going to have nothing else to spend their certs well, on. That's oper well, that's operating on the assumption they won't add things to spend your certs on. Yeah, that's another problem. God, it's already going to take three years to get everything. But um, 
<laughs> but no, I think they're going to be adding a lot of... Con- they're going to be adding a lot of weapon side grades. They're probably going to be adding skills within the classes and other certs. They're definitely going to expand maxes. Maxes, I think you can only spend a very limited number of certs on. But at the so same I, time, I, if, for example, AM... Like, at, at one point, they were talking about, you know, how the Galaxy was an AMS for a while. Oh, yeah. And they were talking about having the Galaxy be an AMS only for dedicated Galaxy pilots that spent a bunch of uh, resources in the tree. Right. And they said that way we'll have only a few galaxy pilots that are AMS instead of a lot. It's still a cool feature, but it doesn't dominate the battlefield like it does now. That's all well and good. But if that's a useful tool that becomes very important to have, people will save up for it and buy it. And then you don't have scarcity anymore. You just have a time before everybody has it. So balance through scarcity is not a good idea in a game oh, where you have no a- cert cap. I don't think it's a good idea, but I can see that it will work. It, it will work in a mm. mediocre I'd, fashion. I'd rather than balance. As a short term, I can see it working, but long term, as Bridger said, it's just it's uh, unrealistic to expect people to not get it if it's good in well, any well, way, shape, just, or form. That's people just that play the game so- seriously selling are pure joy for, for certs. As soon as they start selling pure joy for certs, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're going to find things to make you spend certs on. Because that, yeah. that, that, that's SOE's way, I think, of, of fixing the issues. Is They're not going to necessarily rebalance everything. They're just going to find other cert dumps to continue that balance that they started now. Oh, so they're going to add new overpowered things that you have to spend certs on to get or, access or, to. Or they'll start <laughs> selling the, the bits of, of flair for your uniform for service. They'll find some way of making those things stay scarce without changing the overall system. I don't want it to stay scarce because of you know the inability oh. to purchase it. I want them to stay scarce because it fits a specific role and it's balanced and not everybody thinks it's the best thing in the world to get. That's my point, is it should be balanced in and of itself you know, it's power versus... Oh, the... I agree. Now, now. And I, 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 I think they should never give AMS because the way that galaxies work now is actually pretty awesome. You are afraid of a galaxy drop because you can generally assume that a galaxy filled with 12 people or two galaxies filled with 12 people are really going to know what they're doing and they'll be able to get all of the terminals and everything. Have to. I would love so, to see little upgrades for a galaxy that would impart some kind of bonus to people dropping from it. Like yeah. for the next 30 seconds after you drop, you have a small shield that absorbs 10% damage or you run a little bit faster because you just got a jolt of steroids shoved into your arm before you got shoved out of the thing. Like that would be a cool little thing. So it's like Galaxy Pilot says, my galaxy makes you run faster. And another one's like, no, come to my galaxy. We have cake. And you don't trust that one. But um, <laughs> that, that would be actually really cool. I, I think we've actually used that at some point in our warp gate to try and get people in our galaxies. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Oh man, that's true. Uh, so don't trust that one. He was speaking the truth. <laughs> don't trust it. There's no cake there. So, there is no cake. There is only being forcibly dropped over the crown. There is only being forcibly dropped. Uh, you you invite people by saying we're going for Mesa Sky Dock. It's gonna be fun. Everybody get in, and they're like, wait a minute, this isn't the way to Mesa Sky Dock. You lied to us. <laughs> Everybody panics and jumps out early. You're like, no. Oh, no. Because if you hit the, if you hit page down on your galaxy and bring up the menu, you can switch it to locked yes. status and air save it. It will boost everybody else out of the damn thing all at <laughs> yep. once. Have fun. Take it for for the Vanu. Do it. <laughs> but, but yeah, Scarred Maze of Sky Dock is the best place in the game that's because cool you can't one. because you cannot get there from the ground. That and that's what makes it the best. Yeah, it's very unique. And I, the first time I accomplished, I, I found it. Like, I knew there were other ways, like the jumps up to biolabs and stuff. I had countered that. So I spent the first 10 minutes in that zone running in circles around this thing going, there's got to be an elevator or, or, or jump a pad. jump pad somewhere around here. And eventually finally came to the conclusion that there's no way to get up there. And I had to call out, hey, Joe. Can you get a galaxy for us? We're just sitting here. We can't get up. <laughs> but I'd love to see more unique 
uh, bases like that. Like, like you know, it'd be cool as a base that were not accessible by air that required everybody to use land vehicles. Other other stuff like that that where where the bases are uniquely accessible, I think will create interesting scenarios. Maybe uh, like on Indar, a couple of bases like Scarred Mesa, uh, uh, just one or two for the other other smaller continents. I would love to see bases that are like built into the side of a mountain, like a complex that's like in a cliff face, yeah. even shaped like a skull. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, no, I was thinking more along the lines of maybe another kind of major facility that's underground instead of being like an above ground thing. And it has major areas that tanks can drive into, but then smaller areas that branch off of there that only infantry can get into. And it, you know, a big large complex, an underground complex that you'll, has you'll some like other that purpose. until people start using MCGs and slashers against you and those. Always. Well, there has and to then be enough flanking then you'll, maneuver then and vertical you, space for light. Yep. I mean, you can do it in a way that's still fun, more fun than a biolab. I, I, but but those, <laughs> those weapons will dominate in that kind of – in long corridors. You're just asking for lashers and MCG. Maybe long. if they bring the flamethrowers back. I miss those. <laughs> I don't know why they got rid of them, but – no. It, oh, suddenly, you can't see down the hallway. It's filled with fire. Guia says, actually, they're planning on doing that, but it's a limitation of the engine right now that they can't huh. do underground bases. And that was actually very surprising because what is the place right next to the crown? Is it um, to the one to the west? TI Alloys? Alloys, yeah, TI Alloys. I know when we were attacking that a number of times, you can actually see sort of in the back of TI Alloys, there is what looks to be a big door that leads into an underground facility underneath TI Alloys, but there's no way to get in there, obviously. Uh, and, and it looks, and I looked and I was like, that would be really cool if that door connected to the upper TI Alloys area and there was a whole underground facility to fight over sort of underneath that. That would be cool. That would be an additional way to fight for Alloys instead of just climbing straight up the mountain. You could attack it from below and come up, uh, you know, uh, either one of the elevators or a set of stairs. That would be a cool thing. They physically cannot punch a hole in the bottom of the maps, <laughs> he says. The only, the only way that they could do a, a, a base that would operate that way is to build a massive building structure yeah. that operated like a city, which I think is what the biodomes were supposed to be. I think that was that's why the biodomes even exist, is to provide that kind of engagement. Yeah. It just didn't turn out that way. I would love if the biodomes had a lot more vegetation in them and it was really... Like... Like Arnold Schwarzenegger in in, in uh, Alien vs Predator, like you're going through. Where's at night? But it's it's not night right now. But they might you still know, be in the here. The only reason we really come out at night is because that just makes the teal shine that much brighter. <laughs> All the glowy bits. What the hell is it with those guns and the bright LEDs that say "Shoot me"? <laughs> I, well, I was... somebody in Vanu High Command thought they were playing laser tag. <laughs> I guess so, because when I played as Vanu for a while in the beta, and when night fell, I would curse, because now I'm looking at the gun I'm holding in front of me, and it's got this bright-ass light, and I'm trying to see, I'm peering into the top dark part of my screen, <laughs> and um, my night vision is ruined by this bright light in front of me. I'm like, I'm like holding a cigarette at night on guard duty. Like, this is a terrible idea. I'm killing my... Uh. The same thing happens in a Reaver, by the way. And I think in the other ESS, you have this, at nighttime, you're trying to peer out into the darkness. You got this bright interface down at the bottom of the screen that's like clearly, shining at you. Clearly in the far future's dimmers will be a lost technology. Of course, my 98 Buick knows how to dim the lights of the LED screen that says the clock when it's night out time. But apparently in the future military technology is not able to replicate the technology that's in my Buick. The entire fight over Araxis is actually to reclaim lost dimming technology. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Whew. All right, so I think we've covered plenty of different things. Any final thoughts, I guess, before we close it out for tonight? Uh, you be careful with those final thoughts. All of us have thought ADD tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and now um, my final thought. <laughs> Planet Side 2... And then two, the other final thought. <laughs> Planet Side 2 is a fantastic game, and when people... Just go into it, and I turned into an old lady there. I was trying to do Jerry Springer, couldn't do it, couldn't hold on to it. And now for my final thought, let's let's just uh, let's just say uh, I see a lot of room for improvement, and I think Sony does too. Uh, they definitely have identified a lot of different things, like the certs. Uh, the, the, like the station catch purchases being account bound that we talked about earlier, um, and. Um, a lot of different things that they can do to improve the game because, let's be honest, the game launched in essentially a beta state. What they called a beta was actually an alpha, 
if you actually use the real term the way it's supposed to be used. Uh, and so we still kind of have an incomplete game that is still extremely fun. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the next six months, what gets added to the game. I mean, people are talking about, you know, three-person ground vehicles that allow you and your buddy to tag along and, and do some kind of like a buggy style. They kind of talked about how that's something they wanted to add. Faction-specific buggies, things like that. I'm really looking forward to the future, and I hope it doesn't take too much longer to unlock everything. Oh, outfit plugs. We should probably plug our own outfits. Sure. Plugs. Absolutely. We're always going to do go. that. You can go on, Bridger. All right, so you Team host. Legacy is probably something that many of you know about. It's a, it's, a, it's a Guild Wars 2 guild is what it started as, but we're trying to branch out in a number of different other games as well. Planet Side 2, very similar in concept to the World vs. World mode in Guild Wars 2, so that's what initially brought us over to it. So we're, uh, we're, we are recruiting. That's TeamLegacy.net is how you can get a hold of us. And we usually play, get the whole team on, uh, Fridays and Sundays, because much of our playership is still also playing Guild Wars 2 during our regular Sunday through Thursday raid nights in World vs. World. So uh, that is, uh, that's Fridays and Saturdays is when you can see most of our outfit on display. But we are usually on for the early part of the evenings before we go play Guild Wars 2. We're playing Planet Side 2, and I think we're going to be expanding our times that were available uh, soon. But we need to get a big enough uh, dedicated Planet Side 2 uh, membership before we can do that because too many of us disappear and play Guild Wars 2 uh, during the actual official Guild Wars 2 time. So play, uh, that's TeamLegacy.net. That's where I am. All right. Uh, Matt. All right. Uh, I'm uh, actually a captain in the Black Square. Uh, we are a Vanu guild on the same server, Waterson, as uh, TL. You may oh, have yeah. known us. We're Waterson, because, I forgot to say. Yeah, because we've been shouting at Vanu. Um, no, we actually helped to uh, organize the Vanu outfits uh, on the first few nights of release and, and, and uh, conquer a couple of continents, including uh, we are the server first to conquer Indar, along with the other uh, VS outfits. Um, we actually play pretty much most of the nights. Um, you can find us at theblacksquare.net. Basically, if you play Vanu and and you're you're you want to work with people who know how to get things done, and we still are relatively casual, serious casual. It actually is a thing. <laughs> it's at theblacksquare.net. All right, East. All right, I am uh, I'm an officer in the. Uh, 58th Steel Legion, we're a TR outfit on the Connery server. Um, I don't have a fancy website for you, unfortunately. That's my outfit. Uh, a pretty close-knit group. Uh, we stem from playing other MMOs together, other shooters. Uh, we're all semi-casual, but we have our hardcore moments. Um, so if you're on the West Coast, you play Pacific Time. We are recruiting, so we're usually on later in the evening. So, all right. Uh, you can get a hold of me in game, and I'll type that in chat. And, and at some point, I think TBSQ and TL have to organize a fight over the scar, uh, scarred base of Skydog. <laughs> outfit versus outfit. Yeah, there you go. You have to tell everybody else on your faction. Nobody else come to Scarred Mesa. That's the showdown time. This no, is no, we'll, 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 just, we'll just tell them the crown is ripe for the picking, and then we can fight at Scarred Mesa. <laughs> it's a trick. <laughs> I like it. So next, <laughs> next time we get together in two weeks, that's going to be on, what's today? Today's the second. So on the 16th, we're going to get together again here on Sunday at 7 Eastern time. Uh, that is going to be a little bit more... Uh, organized and specific. We're going to talk about some kind of specific thing, whether it's going to be we've got a bunch of different ideas, we'll throw something together for the roundtable, a very specific topic to really go into depth on, uh, as well as the recent news and any good stories that we had to share between now and then. So, I guess with that it's probably time to, uh, to sign off. The birds think it is. So, thank you guys for watching. Good night. For the new conglomerate. I'm Bridger and signing body. off. And, and no TR? TR doesn't well, care. For the Terran Republic, I am. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta get hang on, hang on, hang on. We gotta do that again. <clears throat> for the new conglomerate, I'm Bridger. For glorious Red Republic, <laughs> <laughs> I am East Clintwood. <laughs> and for the Vanu, home of the laser rave, I'm Army Knife. <laughs> Have a good one, everybody. Take care.